again and now Cassia. Uh, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Ed, Ed 2020's first keynote speaker, Dr. Neil Hefferman, who is a professor in Worcester. Did I get that right, Neil? Did yes, you, you did. <laughs> Worcester Polytech Institute. Uh, so Neil's dedication to student learning is evident not only through the hundreds of publications that he and his students have authored, but also through his other contributions including his work on assistments, his nonprofit, which is centered around improving education without compromising student time. Neil truly integrates the disciplines of computer science and learning sciences, but he also brings in practical teaching experience. So some of you may not have known that he taught in US public schools for two years uh, under the Teach in America program. I first had the pleasure of learning about uh, Neil's work when I was a grad student back in uh, early 2000s, and I discovered Ms. I'm going to mispronounce this, linguist. You got it. Okay, good. This is a computer tutor that uh, Neil built to help students generate algebraic expressions. And I was really excited and inspired by uh, the discovery of this tutor because it was the first computer tutor that I knew of at the time that actually approached interacting with students. It interacted with students the way a human tutor would. So it had high levels of interactivity. It, it asked probing questions, and it broke the problem down uh, for the student. So the system continues to be a source of inspiration for me and my students. In fact, we recently read your paper during the reading group. So since then, Neil has carried out influential research in a variety of areas uh, with that goal I mentioned earlier of improving student learning. Today, he will be talking about his assessments work, which has received over $35 million in external funding from agencies like NSF, IES, and the Department of Education. So assessments is an online platform that serves two critical functions. One of those functions is to support student learning, but the second function is to help researchers run randomized trials so they can test hypotheses on interventions that uh, support student learning. So the broad reach of this platform is truly impressive. It has been used by over 2,500 teachers in over 14 different countries. The current pandemic situation makes Neil's work into these kinds of online learning platforms particularly timely. So without further ado, please join me in warmly welcoming, uh, welcoming Neil. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Kasha. Uh, and, uh, and thank you, Rose, uh, uh, and everyone else on the committee. Uh, I appreciate that. The, the, um, um, uh, and Ms. Lindquist is down at the other end of the house, actually. Uh, that would be my, my wife, Christina. Uh, and uh, um, she's the one standing next to me in this photo. Um, um, but yeah, um, uh, good job on actually Worcester, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Actually, I was born in this town of Worcester. Uh, and uh, um, anyways, um, 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 the... Um, uh, let me get right into it, actually. Uh, and so, um, uh, so you did a good job of actually just kind of actually saying, yeah, I'm a professor at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I run the PhD program in learning sciences and technologies. I've been teaching AI uh, for 18 years. Uh, and I'll use AI in my talk a little bit, like in reinforcement learning context of bandits or natural language processing. Um, but I think actually really our community grows uh, by the by AI and its uh, and things like HCI um, and um, uh, uh, particularly a strong real emphasis on actually psychology and running of randomized control trials. Um, there's a conference called HCOMP that actually combines really machine learning and design, and I kind of feel like that's where I actually sit. Um, and so while I've done a lot of papers, like some eighty odd actually papers on actually uh, some, some type of educational data mining. Um, I think I'm actually proud of actually the work we've done where we're actually running randomized control trials uh, that are peer reviewed, uh, comparing different types of, um, of, uh, of uh, interventions. Um, and uh, you referred to actually uh, uh, Miss Lindquist, actually uh, my wife's uh, name before getting married was actually, um, uh, was actually Miss Lindquist. And, uh, and she's been helping me ever since. She's now the executive director of actually the nonprofit that we were able to um, get funded uh, from actually some philanthropies in the past year uh, to actually help us just scale up actually uh, and give away as a free public service 
the assessments platform. Um, my wife was a better math teacher than me. Actually, maybe that's why I studied her as a as a one on one actually math tutor. Um, but she continues to lead the work, particularly actually uh, anything that really involves actually uh, how are we interacting um, with our teachers. Um, and uh, um, uh, I should say thank you to the many actually students and staff uh, uh, at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and I'll be highlighting actually some of them uh, in the coming slides. Um, but let me just first make sure we understand what is assistance before I try to explain to you what I think is actually maybe a worthwhile uh, uh, thought experiment about actually our vision. Um, uh, so anyways, if you were to go to assistance.org, uh, uh, like many of the teachers that are going there nowadays, uh, there's two big things we actually do nowadays. Uh, there's these free open educational resources, okay, that are distributed under actually permissive licenses uh, under Creative Commons. Uh, and we use these free textbooks like Illust for Mathematics, Open Up Resources, Engage New York, uh, and Utah Math. Over half of uh, half of American math teachers actually say they've used some of these actually resources. Um, and so we've been building upon them, uh, taking these, put them in, putting them in assessments. Um, and so that's one of the big things we do. Uh, another thing we've done uh, and that we might be actually kind of somewhat known for is actually having some adaptive things, what we call skill builders. We have about 300 skill builders that are pre-built assignments that will force kids to actually get three right in a row uh, on uh, on some sort of skill. Uh, and that's three right on their first uh, try. And these range from adding whole numbers to actually say quadratic equations and other like uh, what we'd call in America high school topics. Um, so um, um, the, um, um, the uh, uh, I made a little video last night uh, just so you can actually get a general sense. So if a teacher were to come here and they click into say a lesson for mathematics and they click into say unit two and they pick on some lesson, uh, they can actually find the questions they actually want to assign. That's really important to my wife and I. Uh, the computer is not in charge of actually assigning actually what actually is happening. We use Google Classroom or Canvas. Um, I'm actually assigning it into a class at Vincent Olivens. Uh, class that I gave a guest lecture at Carnegie Mellon actually a few weeks ago. Uh, and, uh, um, and now I'm going to actually, now the video is kind of showing uh, we're up at Google Classroom, uh, which is the single most popular learner management system in the United States right now. Um, and, uh, and a teacher who signed something actually the way I just did uh, will be able to see their report. In this case, only my wife is actually in my class and she hasn't done her homework actually uh, that I just assigned actually last night. Um, and uh, uh, and kids get feedback. Actually, we have open-ended questions like this, but then we have closed-ended questions uh, like this one. What is the scale factor? And kids can click on actually and show me the hints and they can get told answers. Uh, so that's a general overview of actually what assistance kind of looks like. Um, another really important thing uh, in my world is the builder. Uh, that is actually, this is our term of art for the thing that allows you to write problems uh, and feedback. And I think actually teachers really need to be able to modify uh, things and feel like they own them. Um, I think it's actually um, kind of a, uh, anathema uh, to many actually intelligent tutoring systems or MOOCs, the whole idea that teachers get to actually build stuff actually uh but i think actually the reason why we've been successful is we've actually made it very easy for teachers to make make their own stuff um and uh, uh and so i actually made some problems last night actually what is two plus two actually and typing in the answer for uh a teacher can actually write a hint like count on your fingers uh you'll see on the right hand side a few different answer types like number, exact fraction, algebraic expressions. We're pretty good on algebraic expressions. You can also just ask open-ended questions, like what are the causes of the American Civil War? And I have not even bothered actually spell checking my video that I made last night uh, for you. Um, but of course, we'd mark that one as an open-ended question, because of course we don't know actually, um, the computer doesn't know actually uh, about this. Um, and. Uh, um, and so the builder itself, uh, actually, uh, and we're particularly good on, say, algebraic actually sorts of stuff. So if you were to ask a question about, like, hey, take this sum, take this equation, and actually like put it in slope-intercept form to solve for y, uh, 
Um, obviously, uh, or it might not surprise you that a assistance is smart enough to do some very basic algebra to actually make sure you actually know um, what it is, uh, what, what is what is the right answer. Uh, so in this case, the right answer, um, I think actually is uh, six minus uh, 2x, uh, but of course, actually six plus x, uh, or six minus x and minus x would actually um, would work. So the builder is actually an important component, actually, uh, in my conceptions about actually how we build platforms that teachers want to use. Uh, this map is actually out of date. Uh, I think there's now 300,000 actually kids actually uh, this year that actually used assessments. Uh, I'd like to really thank our funders that have actually been uh, supportive uh, of our work and, uh, and of the, us giving away this as a free service uh, to hundreds of thousands of kids. Uh, I saw last night actually were almost reaching the half a billion logged actions. That is actually, you know, basically every time a kid makes an attempt, actually we know something about it. Uh, so we track all that. Um, um, of course, we're in the middle of a pandemic and actually hundreds of thousands of people are dying actually. Uh, and it's sad uh, to say that's actually kind of um, uh, been, well, it's in one sense, it's been good for business as we kind of know lots of actually teachers are wanting actually support. Uh, uh, these are our numbers this year, March and April, you see these huge spikes. Uh, normally we have about 300 teachers making an account each, um, each month in say actually February, but in March actually over 6,000 teachers made an account and in April uh, over 7,000 uh, teachers actually made an account. Um, so what is assessments? Kids do work on paper. And then they get some feedback via the computer that can be done in groups. Uh, and I think it's really important, uh, the role of the teacher in actually looking at work. Uh, that is, we, we, we think about it as we operate in a space that relies on and supports the teacher. Uh, I'm not a big fan of intelligent tutoring systems as if like the computer should be in charge of everything. Uh, I love this particular example. Uh, this is um, Ms. Rena Rizak actually, uh, a, um, she happens to be a PhD student with me, but she also is a math department head in the city of Worcester here. Um, and, um, and you can see she's going over this problem. If you look really closely at this image, you'll see she's actually, uh, she sees 80% of her kids said one. Uh, and she's actually trying to talk to her kids about what's going on, guys. Uh, and gals. Uh, it's a really simple actually math problem they're actually working on. Uh, the students have made actually an elementary actually order of operations issue where they've actually added four plus three first uh, instead of actually doing it in the correct order. Uh, but from our perspective, being able to talk about common wrong answers is really important. Uh, and, uh, and so one of the reasons we don't actually always randomize all the problems is because we want, we want teachers to be able to talk about uh, problems and so that lots of kids will see in the class, I'm not the only kid in class that actually made the same error. So um, let me give you actually a, a compare and contrast, kind of like before and after. So what does business as usual look like actually in this world? Um, Nope, take out your homework from last night. Here are the answers. So you're going to check your answers if you need to come up closer. So you can see the teachers actually put the answers up on the board. I used to be a middle school math teacher. I used to do something like this. This video is super boring. It takes like two minutes before anyone asks a question. Uh, and probably most of you actually did math like this. Uh, um, in uh, um, in kind of the experimental condition, there happens to be a randomized control trial behind this. Uh, let me show you what it looks like actually uh, with assistance. Okay, so we're gonna go over your homework from last night if you wanna get out your sheets. Uh, a couple questions we noticed we did pretty poorly on. First question we're gonna look at is this one here. Three to the negative second times three to the negative eight. Common wrong answer was one over nine to the ten. What's wrong with one over nine to the ten? I'm going to pause. 26 seconds in the class. Actually, the class is talking about something, um, something that actually, uh, like I wish I had been able to know when I was a middle school math teacher. If I knew 27% of my kids got this question wrong, and there's 
it would be basically impossible for me to know what are the common wrong answers that the kids are making in class without exit, like surveying for every question to figure out, are there common wrong answers? Anyways, that's really important to us. I get super excited when I hear actually teachers using, um, getting kids to talk about actually what went wrong. Um, and so, um, and so um, let me tell you a little, we did a big study on does assistance work? Uh, well, uh, and so um, before I tell you the results, Jeremy Rochelle was the first author of actually a big study that was done. Uh, he's holding a book called Show Me the Evidence. Uh, let me remind you that actually most interventions that have actually been developed actually in the United States, and that's probably true everywhere, but actually this was uh, particularly looking in the United States, uh, most interventions don't actually produce actually reliable actually improvements. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, if you go look at actually Sternberger, uh, who and Cooper, and that's the, that, that is the Cooper who's written the handbook article on how do you do a meta-analysis. He did a meta-analysis with Sternberger who uh, on looking at 26 different studies um, of intelligent tutoring systems in K-12 mathematics. Uh, and he reports the effects of these intelligent tutoring systems are small to modest. And worse, they might contribute to our, our achievement gap. That is actually um, the difference between the haves and the have-nots. We really want to build technology that will actually help start to close achievement gaps. Here in America, we have these persistent actually gaps uh, between the rich and poor, uh, black and white. And actually, at the very least, we should be checking and making sure our technology doesn't make these things worse. Um, so uh, in 2009, actually, I became aware of the governor of Maine. Uh, see those two laptops there? The governor of Maine, actually, his name was uh, Angus King. He's now the senator from Maine. Uh, he bought laptops for every seventh and eighth grader in the state. Um, and uh, these teachers had been using these laptops for like nine years, actually, before we actually came along and did our study. Uh, so it was a great place to run a randomized control trial because everybody had technology. Everyone was bringing their technology home every day. Uh, and so it was a good place to check and see, hey, can we improve student learning as measured on actually a standardized test? Uh, and so uh, I recruited 44 schools across the state of Maine and handed them uh, over to actually uh, Jeremy Rochelle, uh, the gentleman I showed you actually holding that book. Uh, and uh, they took these schools, first paired them uh, by similar demographics, uh, and then randomized a single one uh, in each pair. Uh, so for instance, you don't have to say all the urban schools in Maine, not that there's there's only really three towns in Maine that would be urban, uh, but you wouldn't want them all in the same actually uh, condition. Um, uh, so um, the uh, the study the the way it uh, worked is actually um, uh, a teacher was randomized to either getting assistments actually. Um, uh, right away or actually waiting two years. And if they were waiting, their existing methods were to do whatever they actually were already doing in their classroom. Uh, but if they were using assessments, uh, they were assigned to the assessments condition, we would actually help them take their take their textbook work and be able to actually get their, get their homework done online. Uh, and they actually can also use some of these skill builders that I actually mentioned. Key thing is the teacher would be able to know which, which kids uh, which kids are having some trouble and, uh, uh, and particularly across across items. So like that fourth item that everyone's getting wrong, uh, you should talk about it. Um, um, in order to do this study, we actually said whatever textbook you're using, we will support. So here's just page 48 from actually some proprietary textbook uh, owned by some big publisher. Uh, kids would actually, teachers are assigning questions from that book. Kids are doing it on paper. Uh, they're then actually putting their answers into assessments, uh, getting feedback on it. Uh, and let's be clear, in this study, um, there were no, none of these fancy hints uh, or scaffolding questions that I'll show some examples of. Kids just got immediate feedback uh, and they were able to find out if they were right or wrong. Um, and our skill builders, there were actually these things called hints that would actually break problems down. Uh, and, um, we sometimes call those scaffolding questions. A skill builder, they had to get three right in a row. So the image here of these three checks in a row is actually showing actually a child who had to do five problems before they got three right in a row. Um, and teachers actually got uh, reports to monitor what's going uh, on. And in particular, actually, uh, we would cut a child off if they're working on a skill builder and they actually did not actually um, 
uh, get actually kind of get on a roll by 10 items, we would actually say, go talk to your teacher and you can come back and try again tomorrow. We would inform the teacher that this child exceeded their daily limit. Uh, and because uh, um, otherwise the computer is just going to keep saying the same stupid set of hints actually at them actually for the 11th and 12th and 13th item. Uh, and so um, uh, this is a picture of Jeremy Rochelle in 2016 when you still actually wanted to get invited to the White House. Uh, before Donald Trump came along. Uh, and uh, he's actually presenting actually the results. I encourage you to go take a look at the paper in the ARA Open uh, uh, and um, by these other colleagues. Uh, the three main findings they actually found out. Teachers reliably change their practices. If you give them these tools, they actually do something different. They go over homework differently. They wind up actually focusing on a very small number of problems uh, from homework uh, and they go in depth. Um, two, we actually had big, actually almost doubling of student learning above and uh, beyond what you would expect on this Terra Nova uh, test sold by McGraw-Hill, this standardized uh, measure. Uh, and we actually, remember actually how Sternberger, who and Cooper actually, I was telling you about actually found uh, these things that actually might be exacerbating achievement gaps. Well, if you, t if you took all the ch children actually in the study, split them out by actually on how they were doing in the prior year's actually test um, uh, on their sixth grade math test, kids that were below the median, um, they gained a huge amount, um, actually well over actually two grade levels worth of actually instruction. Kids actually above the median, they still benefited. The treatment group actually was still better, about 40% better above and beyond what you'd expect. Uh, so my wife and I are super happy that we actually uh, uh, we developed something that is actually uh, helping close achievement gaps. It doesn't close them completely, uh, but it actually starts moving in the right direction. Uh, and so we're happy about that. Um, there's not too many things that have actually been shown to work actually in the United States, as I alluded to. Um, if you go to the evidence for ESSA site, actually, there's only five actually middle school math programs that actually have actually strong evidence uh, of effectiveness. So, um, how is actually this different than actually some actually things you might have heard of? Uh, and uh, uh, there's a bunch of commercial products like Carnegie Learning's Matthew or McGraw Hill's Alex or IXL. Uh, and these things are kind of based on the premise that actually, hey, if a student can learn something, like do we want to hold them back? It sounds like a bad idea to actually hold kids back. Let's let them actually go on and learn the next thing. Uh, I'm here to tell you that's a really, um, um, uh, well, I, um, I hesitate to say a dumb idea, uh, but I'll call it a dumb idea. Uh, it's the idea that actually the computer should be in charge. If you go into some of these classrooms, you will see that actually you, you go to some computer lab actually here in the United States. Some kids are on chapter two of the textbook. Some kids are on chapter 23 and the teacher just taught chapter 11. Like there's no connection between actually what is happening in the classroom and what is actually happening in the computer. And I think that's actually a travesty because uh, what we really should be trying to do is optimize the whole connection that is the, the human, that is, we, we call them a teacher. They actually have a really strong role and they actually can do stuff. Uh, it's not just the computer that can do stuff. So anyways, we like to think of actually a, a good thing to be thinking about is teacher pacing actually, as opposed to self-pacing systems. Um, um, so, but I want to just switch, switch gears and, and tell you what my longer term vision is. Um, so my real vision on assessments is I want to figure out how to crowdsource educational content, actually. Uh, and I built a platform that allows many different ways of running randomized control trials, like an evaluation engine. And when I say educational content, I mean content for students, Okay, like hints and explanations, scaffolding questions where we break problems down into steps. Uh, the, the way I actually watch my wife actually as a human tutor, uh, break problems down into steps for kids or, or say YouTube videos. But then there's also, we wanna crowdsource stuff for teachers that is instructional recommendations, new problems and the mappings of problems to skills. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about some of the work we've been, we've done. We actually have some actually impressive work, but uh, to a large degree, this is a unfulfilled vision uh, that we're working on. Uh, but it was really inspired by this guy. Chris Siege is his name. He's a teacher in Gorham, Maine. Um, and if it looks like my, my jaw is dropping, I'm actually getting told, 
Chris Seed, you you use my system and you wrote actually int messages for every question in your proprietary textbook, but I was too dumb to have actually imagined that anyone would do that. So other teachers that were using that same textbook could not say, hey, I'd like to look at Mr. Lesage's stuff. I'd like to adopt actually his content. Remember how I told you for all those textbooks, uh, we didn't write any hit messages? Well, we have guys like this that did. Uh, and it's inspired me to think about actually what we could do with this. Uh, and so um, one of the reasons why assistance needs to be free uh, is kind of like, why is Wikipedia free? If Jimmy Wales, the guy that created Wikipedia, actually were, were charging actually uh, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica for this content. No one would contribute to Wikipedia. And so we've actually tried to build out our platform that allows teachers to actually share their work. Um, uh, I, um, I also uh, found actually uh, this teacher, uh, Megan Hupska, who actually wrote an article in the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics uh, magazine, uh, where she was also like, uh, using my system to actually put in uh, videos and then actually kind of saying kids are able to persist actually longer. Uh, so this inspired me uh, to really think about our crowdsourcing work. And so I'm going to tell you about first about actually some work we've done on um, crowdsourcing hints and actually explanations. Uh, um, we won't be doing scaffolding questions quite yet, actually, but we're going to be doing this soon. Um, but I was fortunate to actually uh, um, as the Office of Naval Research uh, for some funding, and they actually supported actually myself and my PhD student, actually Mark Stanaporn. And what he did is he actually made it super, stupidly easy for teachers to actually go and hit these little buttons. I want to write an explanation or hint. Uh, so kids, teachers could actually write their own explanations really quickly uh, as they are assigning content. Uh, and uh, uh, if they did, actually, they could actually write it. An explanation to us is actually uh, we'll tell you the answer uh, and a hint, uh, typically a series of hints. Uh, I'll give you an example of an explanation. Um, Mr. Andrew Burnett was the chief teacher trainer in the state of Maine. He's the gentleman that actually taught actually Crystal Siege how to use assessments. Uh, and he's now a teacher in actually Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm going to show you a video he made. He actually uses one of these open educational resources. Uh, you'll see where here it says copied for free from open up resources. Uh, and, um, um, and he wrote a blog post actually kind of explaining what he does. Let me actually uh, show you um, what he so does. So this is exactly what it looks like for the student. So let's say the student looks at this problem and they're not really sure how to solve it. So they just enter an answer and they answer it incorrectly. It tells them that they're wrong. So they've tried once and they try again and they get it wrong and then they try it a third time and they answer it incorrectly. Take a look at what pops up. It's a video that I made using uh, the whiteboard app explain everything and then you just click on the video and the video will uh, run so we have quadrilateral a here and i'm going to make a little and we'll take them through the problem and we'll show them how to solve the problem and when they get all the way to the end it will actually tell them what the answer is 12 so the perimeter of the quadrilateral so so march and i actually created this experimental design we actually wanted to figure out a way uh well well, you know, first March made it really easy for someone like an Andrew Burnett to make content for his class. But what we really wanted to do is try to crowdsource content. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we created something we call the Star Teacher Framework. Basically, we actually got a small number of teachers, I think there were nine of them total, uh, who actually, um, uh, we funded to go write feedback messages for their problems, Andrew Burnett being one of them. And, uh, um, and, uh, um, and uh, these were basically people that actually Christina Heffernan actually picked. These are people that actually uh, we kind of knew their content wouldn't embarrass us. So uh, if new teachers were coming along and assigning, say, open up resources. They would actually get um, hit messages for some for, from one of these nine actually teachers. Um, when you think about it, it's a really good chance this actually might not work. Um, and uh, oh, let's be clear. We really care about learning. That is actually. Uh, we don't care whether they get problems right or wrong. Of course, uh, uh, an explanation will tell them what the answer is. We care about how they do on later problems. So we came up with a way of running a randomized control trial where actually um, um, uh, with a small random probability, actually if there was an, a teacher assist message, actually we wouldn't display it. Uh, and, uh, um, 
If you think about it, there's a good chance this might not work. Actually, uh, our textbook pro providers would love us to think consistency is really important. We can't possibly have some motley crew of nine random teachers actually telling you nine different ways of actually learning your mathematics. Um, but it turns out it really did work. I encourage you to go read the paper that's coming out at Learning at Scale uh, from March, because uh, we actually showed in a well-designed randomized control trial that actually kids learned quite a bit more from these, ex, uh, from these teacher assists. Which is kind of cool because I just told you that actually assessments as a platform actually already already met um, uh, was actually shown to be effective, uh, and that was actually with no hints. And so by actually crowdsourcing hints, we were able to just make things just str strongly more effective. The other really cool thing that March showed is actually we found more teachers like Mr. LeSiege. We had 146 teachers to actually use actually this teacher assist thing of making actually hints or explanations. Um, 29 of them uh, had more than actually uh, uh, 50 problems that they wrote, they, they made assists for. I found two more teachers that wrote over a thousand actually teacher assists. Uh, so I'm right now struggling with actually, and literally like last week, actually I learned, holy cow, we have two teachers that wrote a thousand messages. Um, so we're now gonna go back to these two teachers that were not part of our group. Uh, and actually, um, I'm actually asking um, some of our content people uh, that work actually for Christina to actually uh, spot check actually their work and kind of say, is this stuff gonna embarrass us? Uh, and then actually think about scaling this up and invite them to join our community. I'm really excited to try to actually uh, crowdsource multiple different types of feedback. Um, um, in this work, we've only actually compared hints and explanations and not actually scaffolding questions. Um, but some of you in the audience might actually remember a paper uh, at AI and Ed 2009 uh, by actually Lena Rizak, where actually we compared um, giving out complete solutions versus actually giving out what we call scaffolding questions or tutored problem solving, actually feedback uh, in that study. And we found that actually uh, low knowledge kids were uh, learn better with these step-by-step uh, -step scaffolding uh, problems, whereas actually higher knowledge kids, you could just tell them the solution uh, and tell them to click OK when, when they're done. Um, and so we as a field would love to figure out how to personalize. Um, let me actually not exaggerate. Getting personalization results are really hard, um, but uh, in this case, we did. Um, and when I say scaffolding, uh, what I really mean is something like this. So here's some problem that actually has four skills, equation solving, congruence. The first question actually, the first scaffolding question is the congruence step. Uh, and uh, uh, the second one is actually around the perimeter step. If they say one half back base times Height, you might be thinking here is one at base time type, but we're looking for a perimeter. That's what we call a mistake message. Um, and uh, the third step here is the equation solving step, where once you've figured out what the equation is, you need to figure out how to solve it for X. Uh, here I'm actually just demoing, clicking through some hints. Uh, you can click to the bottom out hint and get told the answer is five. Uh, and uh, um, and then the last step is once you figure out that X is five, you need to figure out actually uh, what is two X. Uh, and so that's what we call a scaffolding actually thing um, and uh, uh, where we actually went into real teachers classrooms and kind of said, what are the questions you actually want to break a problem down with? We'd love to actually crowdsource actually scaffolding questions. And that's one of the next things that is on actually March's agenda. Uh, at the moment, we've only let them actually write hints and explanations. Writing new scaffolding questions is harder because it actually requires you to write new questions. Um, but maybe we might actually be able to uh, scale up that result we actually found in 2009. Let me tell you about a different type of thing we're crowdsourcing. Responses to common wrong answers, okay, for a given problem. Um, and uh, um, like actually uh, being able to say, hey, you failed to multiply the coefficient of the second term. Remember how in the example I gave you from Miss uh, Kelly, I don't think I told you her name, uh, but the lady that was in that video uh, where she asked her question, kids, hey, Why'd you all say, you know, one over nine to the 10th? Um, kids make lots of common wrong answers and it's really important to be able to actually say something intelligent about them. Uh, I used to run around my class and I would, all my kids would screw up actually the, distri the distribution. They failed to multiply the two to the second term. Uh, and 
Uh, if you're not a, if you're a teacher and you don't know that, actually, that's actually not going to be very good for you. Um, and so we right now are building that infrastructure to try to actually crowdsource what are the messages that we should actually give uh, 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 in response to that. Um, I'll tell you something else we're trying to crowdsource. Actually, well, instead of us writing all the content, YouTube exists. There's actually thousands of videos that explain stuff. Uh, so... Um, in fact, Corinne Ostro actually in 2000, I think, uh, 14, actually uh, wrote a paper where we were comparing video versus text. We found actually on average video was working better than text. Uh, and so that inspired us to say, well, what if we actually could just crowdsource YouTube videos? So my PhD student, Ethan Prehar, is helping me actually build that infrastructure. Uh, so instead of there's just this break this problem into steps thing, um, why don't we put a new button on the screen that actually is like, give me a video to help me. Um, and so Ethan and I, hopefully next year, we'll be reporting on actually our attempt to figure out, hey, are our videos actually that are not problem specific, are those actually possibly more effective than actually say uh, hints or explanations or, or scaffolding questions? Um, we, we hope to learn. What are we crowdsourcing? The videos already exist. We're crowdsourcing the mapping of problems um, to videos, figuring out um, so we're actually like paying teachers to actually help us figure out, hey, what are the videos that would be appropriate for actually a given problem? Let me tell you about the fourth thing that is actually student facing, that is just in time student support. New questions, okay, uh, that students want to ask about a problem. Uh, when I was a math teacher, I would actually wander around my classroom and I would often see teach kids ask the same questions students would tend to ask me the same questions over and over again. Uh, and uh, my system wasn't smart enough to kind of like let kids write and ask what that question is and then actually somehow get me to actually answer once and for all actually that. Um, but why don't we actually crowdsource actually what these questions are? We can take a page from Stack Overflow. Like we're all super impressed with Stack Overflow that's uh, crowdsourcing questions and answers to them. Uh, but if we did this in the context of actually a, uh, an intelligent tutoring system on a given problem, what are the questions that show up? We can learn what the questions are. We can learn the answers to them. What would be good answers? And when I say learn, that is what is the answers that we should actually give out such that actually kids will do better on the next problem. Um, we might be able to do some interesting natural language processing to actually let kids type in actually questions then realize, I think you actually mean this. I actually want to do this live. You know, like why is it that actually we're not actually getting answers uh, live from actually um, people in the field, actually be them the teachers or students. Uh, and so anyways, we, and, and I really want to point out that I think teachers can benefit a lot if they know what the questions are uh, that actually kids are asking. Um, particularly think about novice teachers that actually don't have as much experience. Uh, being able to know what are the questions that actually my kids are asking could be really helpful for them. Let me tell you about, let me switch gears and talk about what is stuff that we can actually crowdsource and give back to teachers. Instead of what's like HTML we can spew at kids, what is actually HTML we can spew at teachers, as it were. Um, and uh, if you think about hints and explanations, um, uh, novice teachers need to know what actually uh, the different ways of solving problems. There's gobs of actually teachers in America that actually think there's maybe one way of solving a math problem and actually being able to see the multiple different ways uh, that could actually be useful for their flexibility. Um, I don't actually have any funding on actually this particular element of crowdsourcing, uh, but that's but I'm super inspired by actually uh, Heather Hill and Mark Chin's a ARA paper um, in 2018, where they actually they showed um, if you want to predict which teachers are really effective, that is actually that actually caused the most student learning in their classrooms. Uh, uh, they're the teachers. Uh, that of course they have good, they know their math and they actually, and they give good lessons. An interesting other actually factor that actually explains what is a good teacher is they know which problems are hard. They can predict the answer to this question. Approximately what percent of your students being tested today are going to choose the right answer to this question? Um, we had this data inside assessments about what questions are hard. We should share that with them. 
And similarly, um, Hill and Chin also showed that actually the teachers that are really effective are the ones that can predict the common wrong answers. Uh, I've been hammering actually during this talk on actually common wrong answers, uh, and others have actually said it's really important. We should be able to actually crowdsource actually answers to common wrong answers. Um, uh, here's actually a screen of assessments where a teacher can actually pick and assign stuff. Uh, let me actually show you something that we don't show. This little green blob, actually, uh, I, I mocked up for a grant that I still, I still haven't gotten funded yet. Uh, um, but I know which questions are hard. I actually can tell them 65% of actually kids in the past have gotten this problem right. Uh, I, I wonder if teachers, when they're actually, you know, one of the bad things you might think about letting teachers actually pick which questions to assign. Maybe they pick actually the really easy ones or they pick the really hard ones. Uh, so what if we could actually support them in their, uh, in their question picking by actually telling them, hey, you picked all the easy ones. And what if we could actually tell them 38% of kids actually that, are, that got this wrong in the past uh, actually said 405. And what if we could even tell them, hey, by the way, that's because they've confused the diameter and radius in this math problem. Um, novice teachers could probably really benefit from that. Um, and so um, we right now in this uh, EIR project that actually my wife actually wrote this grant, actually that's a particular U.S. Department of Education grant, uh, we're crowdsourcing, uh, we're paying teachers to make teacher-facing uh, messages like, hey, it looks like lots of your kids failed to multiply the coefficient of the second term. You know, I like to show my students an area model uh, that makes it clear why the distribution rule works. Uh, here's an example of the area model. Uh, we want to take teacher ideas and share them with other teachers. Uh, and that's what our crowdsourcing there is about. All right, let me tell you yet another way we could actually crowdsource something. How about teacher support on comments to open-ended response questions? Um, uh, I, I alluded to in Inside Assistance, you can write an open-ended question like, what are the causes of this American Civil War? Turns out we had 3 million actually responses uh, last year uh, of open-ended responses. Uh, only 10, uh, 10 to 15% of them actually get graded by a teacher. Like teachers don't really grade homework actually, uh, and they probably shouldn't be grading it because uh, it should be a formative activity. Um, even fewer of them actually will tell a student actually what's wrong with their explanation. So we have all these kids explaining stuff and we don't give them enough feedback. Well, um, what if we could steal a page from Google Smart Reply? So those little buttons at the bottom of your email that Google is saying, hey, do you want to respond really quickly like uh, with something like this? So um, I and um, one of my students, Anthony Botello, um, this is actually a screenshot of actually uh, a grant actually we wrote. We're like, uh, we have Sachi, Ganji, and Wei. That's not their real names, but these are real answers to some open-ended questions. Uh, Sachi actually... Um, gave a really good explanation uh, of actually um, where the break-even point is in a simultaneous linear equation, actually sort of thing to say you should use mountain charter if it's less than 100 actually kids, actually, otherwise you should use snowboard charter. Um, wouldn't it be great if the stuff on the right is actually what actually assistance gave back to teachers. And we said, we think you probably want to give this kid a four out of four. You probably want to actually say something good. Whereas Ganji, the second kid, you probably actually want to give a zero or two and say, you need to put in more effort because actually you seem to really fail to even understand this is a system of simultaneous linear equations and you can't just say mountain charter is better uh, and with no rationale. And this way kid is actually kind of actually probably deserves two out of four, and actually she's figured out Mount Charter is better if there's 72 kids, but what if actually, is that always true? Uh, and uh, um, so wouldn't it be cool if like Google Smart Reply, we could actually give out comments? Well, how are we doing on this? So Anthony Patello and John Erickson and some of my students, um, they've kind of shown we can grade kind of well. Um, Meaning we can actually predict actually what the score is going to be. Um, and we're working hard on trying to actually figure out what are the comments that we could actually reuse. Kind of the way Google Smart Reply actually uh, winds up actually, you know, saying yes or no. Uh, they're reusing things. Uh, can we reuse explanations uh, from one, um, from um, uh, 
is can we reuse teacher comments that they, the teacher wants to give to one kid uh, for others? So Anthony actually has a small group of, I think, nine teachers that are actually um, reading kids' open-ended responses, writing comments, um, and then, uh, and then um, I think right now he's actually running a randomized control trial where we're actually now giving out these comments. Uh, I asked him, how are we doing? And he says, I think our comments kind of suck right now, Neil. Uh, I don't think he used that term. Uh, and, uh, um, but I think we're getting better every time we actually give out actually some options to a teacher. Uh, let me go back to the screen. Uh, if, if a teacher says, none of these three comments are any good, and they hit this little button saying, I don't want to do this, that's a, a good reinforcement signal to us that says something's wrong. So, um, so what are we crowdsourcing? We're, we're crowdsourcing teachers' opinions of students' text. That helps us do auto grading. We're crowdsourcing these teachers' comments, and then we're crowdsourcing teachers' judgments of them. And in the end, we actually have a machine learning model that can suggest which comments to give. Um, at the moment, actually, hopefully maybe in a year from now, we'll actually be able to actually say, hey, kids learn more if they were able to get these auto-generated comments uh, to help teachers more quickly respond to them um, than not. And uh, uh, so that study is being run right now. Um, by the way, Ashvini, who's part of that study, actually later today, will actually be uh, talking a little bit about actually something that we did uh, in this case where we collected audio actually from kids. Uh, and she uses something called the Siamese actually, uh, deep learning network uh, to actually um, grade uh, and score uh, uh, stuff. Um, um, all right, so I've now told you about stuff that we could crowdsource for a given problem, uh, either that we give to a kid or to a teacher. But what about actually stuff across problems? Um, and so I want to tell you, tell you about a model of student affect. Um, by affect, I mean uh, like essentially emotion, uh, but affect is what is shown on kids' faces. Um, and that is what comments would a teacher give to kids across many problems? Uh, some of you, you might know I work closely with actually Ryan Baker, uh, and we have actually built detectors of affect, of frustration, boredom, confusion, engagement, as well as actually things like gaming the system, um, where we actually go into, Ryan goes into real classrooms, codes actually um, real kids by looking at them, and then we actually build a machine learned model to actually predict student affect, frustration, and boredom. Uh, so what if we could use those? So Anthony and I and Ryan have been doing a bunch of work where we do stuff like deep learning to say we can do slightly better and predict making these, uh, making these predictions. Um, but my, my vision here, uh, and again, this is a, a paint actually picture, not actually a, a real working system, um, but we're now funded and working on this idea. Uh, what are we doing? We're taking teachers, uh, giving them clickstream data from their kids, um, uh, which you can really imagine in COVID times, uh, they can actually go look at and, and then actually make comments. Uh, maybe actually this first kid uh, is gaming actually, and you look at actually their clickstream data and you say, maybe you should slow down. Whereas the second kid uh, learning uh, uh, Lilith, you actually might actually want to say, wow, you really struggled at the beginning, but you're, uh, but you got better later on. Your persistence paid off. Good job. Uh, or maybe actually confuse Courtney. You actually want to suggest actually she might, you know, she might want to write down the steps of her work. Or you actually might want to say, no, no, I don't want to send any of these because all three of these stink. Um, and so our that's our idea of actually what we call um, this uh, this live chart thing. Um, let me give you now my last example of something we're crowdsourcing. Just similar but not the same problems. Um, we we have these we have these curriculums like Illustrator Mathematics, and they don't have enough problems. Uh, and so we are excited to actually see uh, these um, uh, crowdsource actually from teachers new problems. Uh, so we can do stuff like enable adaptive uh, homework uh, to be actually more effective. Uh, and so. We are, um, um, if we're crowdsourcing, it might be actually useful to just think about what are we not crowdsourcing. Jim Stigler, a colleague of mine at uh, UCLA, he's actually kind of crowdsourcing whole textbooks. That sounds harder for me to actually imagine. How do you A-B test stuff? Uh, but his course Kata actually system has got the sort of A-B actually images there to kind of remind you. We should be A-B testing actually various things. Um, um, 
Uh, one example I haven't talked about, and I'll give an example about actually A-B testing motivational messages. But before to do that, I just want to say the e-trials infrastructure that we have actually now released to anyone in this community uh, is you can go and propose a study to run inside assessments, uh, and we will actually uh, assign it actually uh, into real kids' classrooms. You'll get actually anonymized data. It's called EdTech. Uh, research infrastructure for advancing learning sciences, led by actually Corinne Ostro. Uh, and um, uh, where did this come from? Well, some of you in this community know I've been using my own platform. I've actually published 14 actually studies. We've compared a bunch of different stuff. I think I've alluded to actually scaffolding questions for actually solutions. Uh, we've done actually a study here, worked examples for actually scaffolding questions. We've done another study on should you actually let kids wait to actually ask for help or should you actually uh, force help upon them if they're not asking uh, for it? There's a good paper on this, uh, by the way. The answer is nope, let them ask for it. Don't actually force it upon them is what we found. Um, I told you we actually compared video versus text. Uh, so we actually said, well, what if we actually give kids choices over actually video versus text versus not giving them a choice and we randomly assign them to video or text? Uh, and uh, um, uh, Lena Rizak actually, Rena Rizak actually, uh, and um, uh, I have two different Palestinian uh, students, actually both named Rizak, uh, their sister-in-laws. Uh, and so um, this is the woman that I, you saw a picture of, not to be confused with the person uh, that wrote the 2009 paper with me. But anyways, uh, we have a poster session later today where we're actually, where we're actually looking at a, actually a, a type of feedback and we encourage you to come uh, actually learn about that. So. So eTrials got started by me actually running studies with my own students. I then started actually working with others, other universities to run studies. Uh, like Sydney DeMello and I actually worked together with Kim Kelly, the teacher that was actually in that video, to look at actually comparing two different actually videos. One actually motivated uh, around actually Carol Dweck's uh, mindset theory uh, versus Pekrin's notion of actually uh, the value of mathematics. Uh, and we were able to find actually differences in these different, um, uh, you might call them crowds first, actually videos actually that a teacher wrote and actually ran in their class. Uh, so um, if you were to actually build a study, actually there's a bunch of videos we have where you can learn how do you build a study inside assessments. The key thing is we have this choose condition that actually Put, allows randomization to happen, so you can actually uh, can do that. If you are, are interested, actually, I encourage you to take a look at some of the studies that have now come out. I'm super proud of the fact that we have nine studies that have been published by others using this platform. Uh, I'll take Emily Fife. She did the first one in 2016. Uh, she was a student at Vanderbilt at the time, and uh, and she really was interested in this particular, she was thinking high knowledge kids shouldn't get feedback. I think she was proven wrong in this paper. Uh, and uh, um, But um, as we do e-trials work, we're always actually trying to run a third condition, which is what is the best thing we have so far? So we can help the researcher run their study, but we can also learn as a platform so that actually our, our control conditions get better. If you're interested, I encourage you to go take a look at etrialstestbed.org. Um, uh, and if you actually comply with our institutional review board and your institutional review board to get your studies actually uh, properly overseen. Uh, you will never get anyone's name, uh, but your data will become, uh, after you pre-registered actually your study, uh, your data will also become actually publicly available one year later. Uh, so anyone can see what it is that you did. Um, I'm super proud of the fact that we have 37 papers that I know of that other people have used our data sets. I'm particularly proud of actually Anna Rafferty's actually paper, paper number 34, where she actually uh, is using our released actually experiments. So uh, Adam Sales, uh, who's now a becoming a faculty member at WPI in the statistics department here, uh, and Anthony and March, uh, we've actually released actually 22 experiments, uh, and we're trying to actually um, use deep learning to try to figure out can we do a better job of predicting. Um, who would benefit so that we can then actually decide which condition should we actually put actually kids into. Uh, I get really excited about this because it combines our interest in doing educational data mining, but also with experimentation. 
Uh, I think prediction in and of itself is kind of easy, uh, and we actually want to combine prediction and action. Um, and so um, uh, I want to say eTrials is not just about seventh grade math. Actually, Ryan Baker and I are, are using actually this eTrials randomized controlled infrastructure to run experiments in a bunch of UPenn uh, MOOC courses. Um, um, most of those stuff where I've talked about so far are where teachers are unaware, they're embedded studies, mostly in our skill builders. If teachers have to be aware, uh, we call that an orchestrated study. That's more costly for us to do, uh, but we've actually helped actually two different researchers, Walkington and Otmar, actually take their own ideas. Uh, I'll give you an example. Candace Walkington, she's actually, basically works with actually done all these small scale studies in sort of lab studies to kind of show if you actually give math problems uh, that, uh, coach the math problems in an area that kids care about, uh, they learn more. So she's working with actually vocational high schools uh, and she wanted to be able to let kids write problems for their vocational area. So if they're in auto shop or cosmetology or health science, uh, what if the math problems were actually arranged actually uh, like that? So uh, I was part of this grant. I actually helped uh, her uh, build that infrastructure for kids to write their own problems uh, in, inside assessments. And so new researchers who want to actually take advantage of that actually will be able to use that infrastructure going forward. Um, another study that actually Aaron Otmar actually wrote, and uh, I now realize I'm, uh, I forgot to actually title this side, but some of you might actually know about Vincent Levin's work in actually evaluating Dragonbox. Erin Otmar has actually built something that's kind of like Dragonbox, but she thinks it's better. Uh, Assistance actually is part of the mix where we actually are running our pretest and post tests across actually gobs of actually classrooms, as well as actually conditions, uh, con some control conditions that are immediate feedback uh, control condition and a delayed feedback control condition. Uh, and so anyways, if you're excited about this idea of actually using our platform, I encourage you to get on our mailing list. Tell us about the types of studies you actually like to do. I can really quickly read your study and figure out if this sh should actually work for us. So anyways, I've been trying to tell you about crowdsourcing, actually, and someone is going to release something big and free, actually. Um, and um, we all kind of know like Stack Overflow and Reddit and Wikipedia are crowdsourcing. Uh, if I was in a group of math teachers, over half of American math teachers actually are using teachers paying teachers. I think there's something wrong that teachers are having to pay for content. I think we can crowdsource this stuff. I want to give some shout outs to some people that I think are doing some really important work, like Paul Denny, Hassan Kosari, and actually Samir. Actually, uh, they're crowdsourcing stuff from kids uh, to share with other kids. I don't think at this point they've actually kind of uh, hit the nail on the head and actually been able to show they can cause better learning because of this. But actually, they are doing some really important work. Some people like actually Joseph J. Williams and actually Jake Whitehill um, have actually uh, been able to use Mechanical Turk to actually crowdsource stuff from Turkers uh, and then actually use other Turkers to kind of uh, see if kids learn from that content. Um, and um, Yuho Kim is actually a gentleman that I encourage all of us to pay attention to in Korea, uh, who actually is really actually working hard on these problems. Uh, and so I don't want to pretend actually this this idea of crowdsourcing is new. Actually, in fact, they came up with the term learner sourcing, which I really like. Um, but um, uh, I was just reading actually in Bob Slavin's report that the United Kingdom next year is going to spend a billion dollars due to COVID uh, on giving out one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Uh, and the Netherlands are doing something similar. Uh, and uh, um, how can we use all this energy that's going to go into actually one-on-one -on -one uh, tutoring. And if those are things like in like some Zoom or Google Hangout like thing, how can we actually reuse something? Like if, if there's 20 or 30 minute actually long Zoom sessions, it's going to be hard to imagine how do we reuse that content. Um, but I have a vision. My vision is that actually we should be able to actually tutor kids, but also get better as we go. And so just imagine Gabriella is a freshman. She's born in the South Bronx. She's the first person in her college. Uh, family to go to college. She wants to become a material scientist, but is lacking some self-confidence. She's taking a University of Pennsylvania actually MOOC course. Uh, and uh, and as she hits some topics on integrals, she struggles. 
uh, on the first two questions. And she considers going to the discussion forum and asking a question, but then she sees a button. Imagine there's a button on the screen, ask the teaching assistant, she types in a question. And Shanice, the tutor employed at the university, sees that question and provides an explanation. And Gabrielle is then able to use that explanation and solve the next problem. Uh, and so in the background, the AI should log actually the question and the answer and the context uh, and the details of Gabrielle's performance so we can figure out, hey, is this answer of, of Shanice is actually any good? So like maybe the next morning at 7 a.m. Uh, when all the other human tutors are offline, and some kid Marcus actually asks a similar question, we should be able to actually figure out of the say 40 questions that we've actually crowdsourced that we know answers for, uh, we could actually ask Marcus, hey, are you asking about A or B? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Marcus realizes, oh, question A is really just a different way of actually asking what he just actually asked. And then Shanice's answer comes out to Marcus. Uh, and so um, I'm excited to think that we can learn actually from real tutoring sessions online. Uh, uh, and anyways, that's my, that's my big hope actually. And we're working hard on trying to use some reinforcement learning techniques to kind of like, I don't know, automate actually how chatbots actually work. Um, and so um, anyways, that is uh, my talk and it's now time for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Neil, for that super interesting talk. Thank you uh, for chill clapping. <laughs> thank you for the chill clapping. Um, thank so you. the way Q&A will work um, is that I leave questions. The audience is welcome to uh, vote on questions, so those will show up sooner. Uh, we are a little bit over time, but I think we have time to have some Q&A. Is that correct? Checking with the organizers? Perfect. Um, OK, so I'm, I'm going to start. Um, since there haven't been votes, I'm just going to start with the order that they were asked. So the first question is from Vincent, and Vincent says, regarding teacher pacing, it sounded like you were advocating keeping all students in sync, but when some students naturally go faster than others, perhaps I missed something. Yeah, like like I think actually we should actually have like our like our skill builders do a little bit of adaptivity, but we actually don't want to actually let actually what is going on in the computer be disconnected from the class. And clearly we need to actually, some kids go faster than others. And we, so figuring out how to balance that, I don't think actually the intelligent tutoring system community has done a good job. I think they've actually erred on the side of the computer is in charge. Uh, and I'm kind of arguing that I don't think that's a good idea. Um, and uh, Vincent might want to follow up on that, but I don't see a follow up here. So I will um, go on to the next question. Uh, and I apologize, I hope I'm pronouncing this right correctly from uh, Karishma, who said, uh, Karishma Galani, who said, What are your thoughts on the EdTech crowdsource company uh, Brainly? Have you heard about Brainly? No? I, I don't. So I'm sorry, I can't say anything about that. I frankly had neither, and I, I madly Googled it. <laughs> but but um, so uh, uh, that uh, all I know about it is that it's a, a, a company that crowdsources feedback from teachers. So it, it sounds relevant. Uh, okay, uh, I, I will check it out. I uh, like. I think actually the young PhD students in the audience should really be thinking about like like what is the role of crowdsourcing going forward. Actually, uh, I've kind of shared our my little thoughts on that, but actually, I bet actually some other smart people uh, are going to figure out how to actually do this even better. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so the next question, and again, I apologize, I'm probably not saying the names correctly. Comes from, and I just bounced off my screen from uh, Hailing Lee. Let me bounce off my screen. There's lots of questions pouring in now. Uh, have you tried to use crowdsourcing methods to automatically score open-ended questions? Yeah, and so, uh, right, uh, well, I cited a paper here where we actually do a little bit of that, where, and uh, 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 I think the slide said, we kind of do it kind of well. Uh, and so the scoring, I think, is kind of easy. Figuring out what to say back to kids, that's what's hard. Uh, and uh, uh, there's been a huge amount of work on actually like, peer grading. And so the grading, that's not the, I don't think that's, I encourage actually the young folks in the audience to actually not focus on just grading actually and scoring because I don't think that's the hard problem that we need to solve. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, Vincent did follow up and he agrees with you. He also, that balancing is important. He also points out the question by Matthew Bird seems to relate to this, so I'll read that next. Okay. Um, question by uh, Matthew Bird says, uh, and excuse me, they bounce off the screen. I haven't found a way to stop that yet, which was there's more questions coming in, which is good. The question is a bit of an application question. Earlier, you mentioned having students at different points in the class based on their skill level. Some, uh, some schools take that concept and apply it to the entire grade level, like CAN lab school. But by doing so, they're no longer compatible with the rest of the system. No GPA, no grades, et cetera, for students to submit to colleges. How do you create useful, large instructional changes if the rest of the system requires that you need to be compatible with them? Yeah, I, I like, you know, this, uh, um, uh, th there's this tension, right? Like here in America, we want, you know, we're screwing over a lot of kids in America, actually, and not giving grade level content, right? Actually, when I was a teacher uh, uh, in the city in Baltimore, uh, we were really dumbing down stuff and kids have been screwed for years uh, and they didn't know how far beyond, behind they were. And so figuring out how to use technology to help bring kids up a little bit, but yet actually also have them synced with their classroom is the real tension. There's like this group, actually, uh, School of One, actually it was called, I think it's now called Teach to One or something, where they actually try to regroup kids every day into different groups based upon actually their data. Uh, that doesn't seem like a plausible actually real model to me, uh, but the general idea of actually, how do we actually get kids to actually encounter grade level content and not actually just get actually like give, given dumbed down stuff because they're a little behind, uh, but yet provide a little bit of extra support so they can actually succeed at that like, I think that's the trick that we actually need to devise. And I think that's what I encourage people to try to figure out how to work on. Because uh, uh, kind of the way we do this, particularly like in the community colleges here in America, where if you, if you didn't do very well, we actually just force you to take algebra again at the college level. That's probably not a very successful technique. Uh, how do we actually, how do we help kids move, move forward actually um, uh, and I think some amount of adaptivity is important, but I think actually helping actually kids have real teachers actually connected to them on a daily basis seems like really important. And I think we've kind of forgotten that in the intelligent tutoring system, AI and ed community sometimes, and that would be at our peril. Thank you. Uh, uh, Claudia, Maddie, I'm going to leave it up to you to cut me off. Otherwise I will continue reading questions. All right. Um, so uh, the next question comes from Kashika, Horeaiska uh, Pomska. So the question is as follows. As the, at the moment, assessments with all its promise and affordances is somewhat US centered. Have you explored or are you planning to explore what it would take to deploy it in other educational and cult cultural contexts? I'm, so what do you see as the key challenges for such deployment? All uh, right, I didn't actually brag about the fact that actually I had a, a, a group of students actually internationalize the system. So actually the interface can be actually in Arabic and Chinese. I'm actually quite proud of that actually, if we had been in Morocco, um, Ephraim actually, um, well, there's a group in Morocco that has actually translated a huge amount of our content into actually French and actually um, uh, Arabic. Uh, and, and are using it actually in Morocco. Uh, I haven't sit, spent a lot of actually time on actually trying to figure out how to actually make it really work in these more international contexts. Like it's hard enough to just actually figure out how to actually make uh, assistance work well in US schools. Uh, but um, um, I'm proud of the fact that we give this f system away for free and actually others are able to build and build their own stuff that they, that they see value uh, in. Thank you. Um, so I think there's time for uh, one more question. There's a question that um, came from Bruce McLaren, and Bruce says, can you expand a bit more on the work you and your students have done with uh, video hints and feedback, especially the project where you will crowdsource videos for hints? Is that work to be done or published? What are your research questions for this work? Yeah, so so right, so I, right, so I alluded to that learning at scale paper that March Denaporn and I actually just published. Uh, some of those were videos, actually they were crowdsourced. Some were text. Uh, we actually still don't know, actually, hey, um, 
are, are the teachers that wrote video hint messages, are those more effective than the teachers that wrote actually text messages? Uh, we don't know that yet. Uh, I'm hoping we'll be able to say something intelligent about that in the future. Uh, in fact, we'll be, uh, in fact, the data set is actually released so people can actually study that, but we're going to take a look at that. I kind of suspect that we're hope. I bet we'll actually find uh, for lower knowledge kids, actually certain types of things like video or step-by-step -step scaffolding is probably going to be more helpful. Whereas high knowledge kids will actually more cut to the chase sort of approaches actually uh, might be effective. But at the moment that is speculation. Uh, and it seems like some domains might lend themselves better to uh, video presentation than others. I'm just thinking about uh, programming when we code chase a program, it's a very dynamic process. And so seeing it in video as it unfolds, is really beneficial where sometimes it seems like having a, a more static presentation might be just as good. Yeah, I, I, right, uh, uh, right. Uh, I have a general feeling that actually video could be really effective, particularly for kids that aren't really very good readers. Uh, it's obvious video has to be better at, say, kindergartners, actually, when they don't even know how to read. Uh, but, uh, like, I'm a really good reader. Most of us in this, at a conference, the PhDs are really good readers. Uh, so, I don't know, figuring out actually what would be good for what, it's going to take another 100 years for us to actually get good at figuring out what, how to personalize the learning experience, I think, to, to kids. And so I, I don't want to pretend we've hit that out of the park. But we're working on it. Um, so thank you. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for a fascinating talk. There are 